today we're going to talk about the three sectors um, of you know public, private, and nonprofit, and we're going to compare them in terms of their organization, administration, and finance. Um, this lecture is based on several chapters of uh, Leisure Services Financial Management. Um, previously, when this course was a uh, fourth year of financial management and recreation course, you know, I, I used this textbook, but um, I, I always found it a bit repetitive. So uh, this lecture is a, mis a mishmash of all of the uh, you know, different parts of these chapters. So we've already talked about the private sector. Um, we learned about that in HKR 2100 about the three sectors. And, you know, examples include um, like Walnut Climbing Center, um, Outfitters, you know, O'Brien's, uh, like boating, the little gym. Um, I've got, I think this is actually a yoga company that might not exist anymore. Um, and then uh, cast on, cast off. I'm not sure if it exists either uh, still, but it was a wool supplies, like for yarn, for knitting. You get like, I uh, see kayaking. Um, and in fact, uh, people who run many of these organizations, um, some of them have are graduates of the School of Human Kinetics and Recreation. So how does the uh, private sector operate? Well, Well, in the private sector, it's really the customer difference. Businesses obviously rely on value transaction with customers, whether that transaction, you know, that value transaction is a good or a service. There's obviously money is exchanged and in some way it hopefully meets the has to meet the customer's needs or they wouldn't be purchasing it. You know, the customers have a choice of whether to purchase. And also in the private sector, businesses generally don't have a target market of people who are in low income. That's more what governments and not-for-profits focus on. The um, text kind of focuses a lot on greed as, as a motivator. Um, and, you know, like that greed motivates entrepreneurs to serve customers, to be more um, efficient and to be more effective. And... I have to say I disagree with that, um, and I actually took that out as a slide um, because I kind of feel that, I mean, obviously, um, when you're trying to make money and make profit in order to, you know, ha um, have uh, an income, you're going to try to be as efficient as you can. And I know, obviously, the, um, there is greed in the world, uh, a lot of it, but I think that for a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in our sector, like in recreation, leisure, sport, physical education, et cetera, education, um, it's really about like helping people and also like sharing our knowledge or, um, you know, teaching. And the book also points out the various ways in which government could be more like business, but ultimately says that they can't. And I kind of feel the author left out what I mean when I say government should be more like business. Like, I think the government needs to be smarter with how they spend money and also that they could have a few little perks or serve customer needs better if they use their money more wisely. So entrepreneurs begin businesses without knowing if there are customer needs to be met. These entrepreneurs then believe such needs exist, but they aren't sure until they introduce the program, service, or good. So starting a new business venture is riskier than buying an existing business. But once a need is seen, then you develop the service and develop promotional techniques for educating potential customers, you know, to become customers. 
So most business ventures really begin then with the belief in this. You do your market research and then, you know, you're obviously um, you're trying to start a business because you believe that the product or service is what will meet people's needs. Um, this is, uh, from GE Mills. He's actually a noted Canadian business environmentalist. Uh, I, I found that out. Um, anyway, he says that, uh, 73%, um, from the entrepreneur's previous experience with different business, sorry, th pardon me. These are like how people, how business ideas originate. So 73% was from prior experience. They had so that's kind of saying like most people, you have to have a business to start a business, I guess. You know, you're more likely, obviously. 33% um, of new business uh, or business ideas come from business associates. 26% was from experiences with similar businesses. And 19% was from friends and um, relatives. And the thing that I kind of found um, the missing here, like about like personal experience, like you, um, I think probably in our field, it might be like you're trying to seek a service or like one of your family members is, and you realize that like you can't find it. So obviously others. So I think, you know, that's one way of developing um, an idea for a business. So. You can be a sole proprietor, so that's the uh, the definition, is the only owner of a business. My dad was a sole proprietor of a, of a company. Um, he um, left a large corporation, I think when I was about 13. Um, and, you know, um, and, you know, if some of you may have um, family members who are, you know, business owners, and, you know, sometimes at the beginning, you know, um, Obviously, uh, it was a, I'm not even going to explain what the business was. It doesn't matter. Um, but I, it was something that he knew would be successful. But, you know, sometimes, like, clients take a while to pay you back. I can remember times when, you know, my dad didn't have um, money to really pay, like, a salary. He would want to pay the staff, but he had to wait to pay himself. You know, long hours, you're always on call. For many hours, like many times, uh, especially when he was starting off for the first 10 years or so, you know, he was uh, on vac on all of our vacations. He always was on his computer, at least in the morning, and then he would turn it off. But for the first hours, he also uh, was an earlier riser. So, um, you know, it's a lot of work being a sole business owner. There's a lot of risk until things kind of get going. You know, now my... Um, as an example, my dad's business ended up being um, doing quite well, and he ended up with uh, expanding it and had, you know, probably seven employees maybe at the end, or you no, know, maybe it was three, four. And uh, then, you know, someone um, bought him out, and he was, you know, bought his company, and he was able to work there for a couple of years in the transition period and, and retired. Um, people obviously then look at market research options, and there's various ways to find out what people want. Market re research is one of those ways. The probability of success is higher when decisions are based on data rather than feelings or stories. Um, although I'm not sure if I totally agree with that, because that's kind of saying that um, qualitative is not as good as quantitative in a way. But although data can be misleading, market research can identify um, customer needs in a way that shows what products or services customers would purchase. So you usually first offer the product or service in a test market. You know, for example, let's say you want to start a camp. Well, you're not going to start a children's camp, like purchase the land, build this whole thing, um, go into all this debt, you know, build a structure and then, um, you know, decide to offer your camp. You know, you can, you might go and um, 
you know, ha- run a camp as best you can from facilities that you can rent. Or, you know, some camps actually allow you, uh, that's one way they make money is they will rent out the camp space to someone else during times when they're not using the facilities. Although I don't see that maybe as often, but I've heard of it. Um You can also perform feasibility analysis, like from focus groups, surveys, and customer interviews. Market research um, could be like giving out surveys, um, you know, like uh, seeking feedback and to see if the product or service was worth purchasing. You know, I don't know if you've done any of these, like, for example, I have, um, I'm an Air Miles Gold member, um, and that means that I get to do the surveys. And um, I mean, I have done a lot of market research surveys to get Air Miles points because I started this when I was doing my. I started doing the sorts of things when I don't know when I was in my doing my PhD. Anyway, so it's been a long time, um, and. Uh, so, you know, that's one way of doing it. And, and so you can hire companies like that in order to do these types of surveys for you. Although you can also just do it yourself. Um, but uh, you can also do what is like create pro bono calculations that estimate the needed revenues to cover expenses. And this is what's called a feasibility analysis. And that's something I not exactly sure what exactly that all means. It's beyond my knowledge, but I do know that it should be unbiased. And so it's actually best if you hire someone, if you actually had the money. Um, you know, I like, uh, but although sometimes, um, you know, sometimes market research is a bit superficial, as I said, like I've done a lot and I'm not sure that Um, it never actually truly taps into what I want or think. For example, I always think with environmental values when I purchase uh, products or services, and um, that's never like something that they ever ask me about. Yet, I kind of feel like that's something that a lot of other people care about now. It seems like it's, um, they're often very like, um, I don't know, very... um, Mark just market uh, market research driven like not think about values just thinking about you know what you what you purchase and what you know about things very for consumerist people you can also um, look at existing business ventures so you um, you have to like understand what is your competitors so. You have to, to stay in business, you must defend against, you know, competition once you have um, a business going on. And uh, the most competitive in growth, maturation, and uh, declining stages. So in a company, you've got, you know, your introduction, you've got saturation, then it goes growth, maturation, and then decline. So this is saying that competition is greatest during the stages of growth, maturation, and decline. And so how do you stay in business and make sure that you're competitive? Well, it's about focusing on how to better meet customer needs and also retaining existing customers. And I guess, you know, it's also about taking away potential customers, you know, who over so that they don't go over to the competition. Obviously, in a company, you want to uh, be making a profit. So this starts with a budget that shows uh, a profit is possible. You need to not just think you're, uh, well, you need to be pretty sure you're going to be able to make profit. Um, Making profit also means um, that your annual income statement shows that your revenues, the things that you take in, have exceeded your expenses the things that go up, obviously. And it also, you make a profit when equity on the balance sheet grows. So as the value of your company is increasing. So 
So you also need to then understand what's the difference between debt versus equity. So uh, we know that um, equity then is not something that has to be repaid. It, you know, it's the, the worth. Equity holders are paid when the company makes profit. Like um, when, um, you know, like in, uh, in shares or like dividends. Whereas obviously debt needs to be repaid and debtors are paid a defined percentage of interest. So that could be like a loan or anything else like that. So debt plus equity then equals the total assets of the company. Liabilities then include accounts payable and long and short term debt. And the assets then are what the company owns. Uh, owns. Debt is what it owes to someone else. And in the end, then, equity is the remaining value of the company. So to get a business venture up and running, you need to get capital um, needs must be acquired. So this is like to cover operations. So capital needs are the money that you need to get a business started, to cover operating costs. You need to an, an assemble enough capital to cover these costs. So, and how can you do this? Well, it could be personal resources or uh, borrow, borrowing money. Oh, pardon me. So when you um, get a loan, you are have obviously you have left to look at the interest. The interest then is the money paid regularly at a particular rate for the use that you are have borrowed this money, um, and also you there's also a regular rate for delaying the repayment of a debt. So obviously you want to be you know when you're starting. A company, you want to be finding loans then that have low interest rates. And there are, you know, many banks and there's even government programs, you know, that offer these sorts of loans um, to help with, you know, startup uh, money. Other people, like, for example, might use a line of credit. But obviously, then you're wanting to make sure that you're getting the lowest interest rate you can possible. And principal, principal is the word uh, for the original amount borrowed or invested by the lender. So, for example, if I borrowed uh, $5,000, then that's the principal of my, um, my loan. And then, obviously, that principal will acquire interest depending on how long it takes me to repay it. So when you're starting a company, you really then have um, two options for trying to get these capital costs. You have sale of debt or you have sale of equity. So sale of debt means that you're financing a business with a bank loan and that you have to pay it back with interest. Alternatively, you could look for sale of equity, and that is financing a business with co-owners or partners. So, you know, like venture capitalists. So, how do you borrow money? Well, you can go to the bank, but sometimes banks um, are not always, uh, especially if you're someone who's just starting a business, it's your first time, they might not, they might view your business venture as risky and not a good investment. A lot of people use family and friends or personal resources. You know, they might, um, you know, for example, you hear about, you know, people who've helped to finance, you know, their siblings restaurant or something like that. And um, and the capital and startup costs are usually funded by the owner or the owner's family through equity contributions. Another way 
is through uh, venture capitalists. So think of like Dragon's Den. These are investors who are willing to take risks that banks and other lending inst institutions aren't willing to take. Um, it can be the original owners of the company or people who just want to own stock in a company um, or equity. Uh, they're often people who just want to make a quick profit if the value of the stock goes up. You know, and there's people who, you know, make um, a business of this. Now, I'm not so sure that in our lives, uh, many of us are going to be starting uh, businesses in recreation and leisure studies um, or therapeutic recreation um, where we're going to have venture capitalists knocking um, on our door. But you should understand that that is how businesses can get started. You can also, if you're an existing company, you can also borrow money. So how does an existing company borrow money? Well, it can borrow from the bank. So they might borrow money to leverage assets um, using the value of their business assets to acquire more land or more buildings or equipment. Um, if the company is doing well, meaning it has high equity, then interest will be low. If the company is struggling, the interest rate for the debt is going to be higher. I've already talked about, um, you know, selling. You can also sell stock, you know, to venture capitalists, for example. People also can issue corporate bonds. So this is um, existing companies that don't want to borrow money from banks or sell stocks. They issue these. Um, they sell corporate bonds generally. Um, to private investors rent, rather than lending institutions. So in a startup company, usually debt is typically loans from, from a bank. In existing company, debt is usually um, long-term or short-term bonds. And it, it can expand when companies desire to leverage their assets to increase their sales. In terms of equity, in a startup company, equity is often provided by, you know, venture capitalists. In an existing company, um, or, or family and friends, in an existing company, equity is the difference between assets and liabilities. And the equity of a company can be expanded when new stock in the company is sold to new investors. So you can um, make your uh, company public and have it um, have stock, put it, sell stock. Stock are the equities or certificates of ownership of a company. So recall that equity can be expanded when new stock in a company is sold to new investors. So new owners purchase a share of the equity from the current owners. And so corporate stock which is kind of like equity in the company, it's actually bought and sold at a market price. And the value of the corporate stock is traded on the stock market. I've had friends who have worked at the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange. Pretty crazy job. Um, and so the value, you know, uh, or sorry, and pardon me, what determines the price of the stock though, of a company? Well, it's the revenue the company is expected to acquire in the future. It's the state of the company. It's about new products in the works and confidence in the management of the company. And I did not include this here, but I would definitely say politics as well. So there's um, two types of companies then. There's publicly held companies and private companies. Publicly held then are companies that sell stock to investors on the stock market. They have to show their financial statements to both stockholders and potential stockholders. So they do have some transparency that they have to provide. Whereas a private company, especially if it's got like a sole proprietor or you know, equity owners, they're not obliged by law to show any financial reports to anyone other than 
you know, the, the owners. Okay. Um, they, uh, so there's not as much transparency. So you do have, though, um, to look at stockholders. The advantage of selling stock is that there's no principal or interest payments to strain the budget. But the disadvantage is that new investors share ownership. Stockholders have a legal right to have a say in how the company operates. They own a share of the company. They have voting rights and management decisions. They might expect a return in their investment, and they obviously expect the value of their stock to increase over time. And, you know, we've all seen movies um, of, you know, when there is like a takeover and all, and it's always because someone has bought so much stock and has, now they have 41%. Um, and, you know, that's the basis of um, also, you know, a lot of dramas as well. TV dramas. So when you do, when your company is public you and sell stock, you have to have a board of directors. And these are usually elected by the stockholders. They typic, uh, typically the stockholders themselves who own a large number of shares. Sometimes they're people who are put on the board for symbolic um, purposes. And they can also be people who serve on multiple boards of directors. And obviously, we're talking about large companies here, not uh, small ones. But, you know, obviously, the board of directors can get very political. It's very political, for example, in the States. Um, there's a term called interlocking directorates. And these are when you have corporate board members who either serve on other boards or who are managers of other corporations in various industries. So, um, you know, like it's like you have um, someone who is on a board in one type of industry and then on a second industry or you're also, this could be someone who is a manager in a different industry. So it's like having industry representation on your board. Now, obviously, the um, politics of business, you know, the politics do influence business. Wherever there are people, there are politics and business is no different. Um, now, this is particularly, though, when it comes to um large public organized or private organizations and ones that, you know, do have that are uh, publicly held and have, you know, stock uh, holders. So people are elected to boards by stockholders and other board members, you know, so there's politics there and power. There are power struggles on the board for control of management decisions and also on struggle power struggles on the board to determine who is going to be managers. So there's um, a lot of politics that can go on, especially, as I said, in large corporations. This would be especially, for example, think of um, in sports, you know, in professional sports. There's a lot of politics there. So the not-for-profit sector is obviously um, may seem like the opposite end of the private sector, because obviously the mission of a of in the private sector is to make profit. Um, where in you know with the not-for-profit sector, obviously they cannot make profit by definition. But they're still also different from government, because nonprofit leisure service organizations usually have a different mission than government units while offering the same type of leisure services. The nonprofit sector in North America is really quite substantial in terms of the number of organizations, its economic activity, and also the individuals involved. A Canadian survey, which actually is fairly dated, really, um, that I found, it indicated that the sector uh, reports totaling $122 billion annually. So these numbers really translate to large economic benefits when looking at the direct jobs as part of the overall economy. 
And, you know, there's a lot of people who are employed in the not-for-profit sector. And then there's also volunteers, which obviously um, is slightly different, but, you know, there's usually about 6 million volunteers working in not-for-profit and volunteer organizations in Canada. So what is a nonprofit? Um, it's important for you to be able to define a nonprofit. It's not just about not making profit. <laughs> there are different types of nonprofit organizations, including those that operate for public benefit, those that operate for benefit of members only, religious organization, and um, educational organizations. You need to also understand that there's a difference between nonprofits and charities. Um, a nonprofit is usually it's a social or recreational or hobby group, um, like curling club, golf club, um, swimming club. It could be uh, around certain amateur sports organizations, like hockey associations, baseball leagues. So all those are are nonprofits usually. Uh, certain festival organizations, for example, like the St. John's Folk Festival, um, is a nonprofit organization. Uh, in contrast, a charity is a relief of poverty, usually, like food banks, soup kitchens, and low cost housing units. It can be for the advancement of education um, or advancement of religion or for the purpose of beneficial to the community, like animal shelters, libraries, et cetera. So uh, charities, you know, when you donate, you can, don't, you can give money to a not-for-profit and you can give money to a charity, um, but a charity is when you can actually get uh, like a receipt back. You have to have a charity number where nonprofits, they're just like fundraising. So nonprofit organizations then have, um, obviously, they provide a service to its members or to the public. If um, they usually, they obviously have no owner or stockholder who profit from its excessive revenue. And if they do have profits received, uh, these have activities have to be put back into the organization to, you know, further its purpose. And in contrast, you have a charity. It's established and operates exclusively for charitable purposes, and it has to be registered with the Canadian Revenue Agency. Um, and you get an approved registration as a charity with the uh, registration number. Where not-for-profits are registered as, in, like, incorporated as non-for-profits, and that is at the provincial level. So. Charity is a uh, Canadian level, federal level. Nonprofit is provincial level. So, why do organizations in, uh, incorporate? Like, why do you want to become a nonprofit? Um, well, you have to have a formal structure under which to operate, but which is good. It helps. Um, you can also then hold title to land. You can qualify for grants or funding. You can also apply for a lottery license. Um, and it's also about limiting personal liability of members. There are, though, many challenges facing nonprofit organizations. So there is a lot of paperwork uh, sometimes involved in not-for-profit, or it feels like it, like bureaucracy. You have to apply for not-for-profit uh, status, set up all the legal aspects. I've, if you know, if you've taken community development with me or some of my other courses, you know that I used to run a not-for-profit, um, and you know that you have to. Uh, make sure that you're, for example, announcing your annual general meeting, etc. Um, all this sorts of thing, uh, making uh, and obviously with you know, grants and all that. There's a lot of paperwork involved there as well, financial reporting that you have to do. You obviously also have to keep track of like treasury statements and make sure that you've know what's in the accounts and etc. 
Community support is also can be a challenge, but it's also a, a rewarding part of not-for-profit work. Um, relationship building is really essential, and also marketing, because um, it's not it's all uh, marketing is important not just to people who are your potential uh, participants or customers, clients, but it's also about partners and people who are going to help, whether it's in kind or. Um, partnerships or resources, etc. So websites and newsletters, social media, news releases, all this, having a catchy slogan. And a lot of the time, we are actually um, not very good at doing that, especially in not-for-profit. Um, and why is that? Because you usually don't have, I mean, in large organizations, they might have a whole staff person to do that or, or a whole department. Um, like think of, you know, Canadian Cancer Society, um, but, you know, McMorrin um, Community Center doesn't have a, you know, marketing or social media media person, you know, it's just someone whose job is doing it, and, you know, often, um, you know, well, there's someone who does the newsletters, but it's not like the social media aspect might be um, as, as paid attention to. There's obviously a lot of accounting. You have to keep records and file reports with provincial and sometimes federal, depending. Um, you need be basic bookkeeping skills. You might have to hire an accountant. And there's compliance that you have to do. Like you have to file required reports. And how com complex these reportings are depends on how large the organization is. Um, my little not-for-profit, the Community Garden Alliance, um, which actually I've found out has been revived, but un under new uh, directorship. Um, and, you know, that it's a small organization. And so there wasn't a lot of reports that had to be done. Obviously, fundraising is a big challenge with non for profits. Um, and in fundraising, communication and storytelling are essential. You have to solicit donations. You're, you might be like selling products uh, or concessions, you know, like, you know, thinking of Girl Guide cookies or um, uh, the uh, daffodils um, when it's uh, for the Canadian Cancer Society. And large corporate sponsors you might you might actually have in exchange for advertising rights. And you see that, uh, well, a lot in the States, but you see it more and more. Um, I would say, in uh, Canada as well. Look at uh, YMCA. It's a not-for-profit. Um, you know, I was, you know, like there's names plastered all over the place of corporate sponsors in that building. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, doesn't look like the why that I grew up with. Another challenge is obviously generating revenue, and that might be grants or donations from uh, foundations or the government you, uh, in order to have government expenses, and charging membership um, or user fees. So membership might be a big part of not-for-profits. You also might be charging admission to events. So in not-for-profits, they need to generate revenue in some way. And this is called a revenue engine. So a revenue engine is a very profitable service where the fee structures for the program generate substantially more in revenue than the program costs to provide. So meaning it makes profit. It's when you might you have a program or service in a not-for-profit that you are not going to subsidize at all and you're going to make profit and then that um, revenue goes into providing, covering the costs of the other programs and services. So there can be revenue engines as primary sources of income. So this is charging fees, as I said, at making profit. Um, you uh, And you do this then on programs that are expected to be profitable in, using private sector pricing. There are some programs where people are willing to pay substantially more. Um, for example, uh, daycare programs, after school programs, birthday parties, 
usually like fitness membership, uh, camp programs or other example, any type of like instructional class. And as an example, like I went to a um, parent, there was a, a parent ta uh, taught or like parent taught program. I can't remember the actual title. Anyway, that was run at the Virginia uh, Park Community Center. And I and my or my husband, but it was uh, me a lot at the time, we would go a lot to the Virginia um, Park for th for this program. And it was held Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. And it was from um, I can't remember if it was 930 to 1130 or 9 to 11. So two hours. So that's six hours. And at the program, it was, you know, there would usually be a, a craft, there would be a snack provided, and then also it was just opportunity for the children to play together and for the, you know, parents to gap. Um, most of the time, it was uh, a lot of uh, nans that took them, uh, took their grandkids, but and anyway, I quite enjoyed going. And, you know, and I got a coffee and, and a, a chat and got out of the house uh, when I had... Uh, you know, babies, and especially when I had uh, a two-year-old and, you know, an infant. Um, so that was free. That program was free. I would have been very willing to um, have paid for the program. Um, and when I looked there, it wasn't now. Some people were people who um, maybe were low-income families and lived in the community, but a lot of the people that went to the program um, were you know, just, you know, lived in sort of that area of town. And they, either, and you know, some were even people who were nannies who brought their, their children. Anyway, they could have had a different fee structure for the people who could pay. Instead, they made it for free. I would have been way happy to, um, you know, have, have paid a bit, at least to cover some of the costs. But I think they could have made profit on that. You can also then um, get revenue, a revenue engine from a membership model. So this is where people pay to join the agency and pay no additional fees, you know, for using certain services. And you think of, you know, the YMCA is um, a good example um, where, or another example is a country club um, uses a membership model. My, my parents belonged to one. You know, you have an annual fee to be a member or a tennis, a tennis club is another thought. So in the membership model, there's sometimes an upfront initiation fee, like um, like the one-time cost to join. This is often used, especially if it's like a country club or that sort of thing. But in places like you know YMCA, often um, if it's like low-income people that are accepted or you know are part of the not-for-profit or that's the mandate, then that is waived, or they don't even do that. Um, but there could be an annual membership fee. Again, you can also waive that. Uh, if you do have a membership model, you can waive that, depending uh, partially or totally waived. And there can also be then like some programs that have additional program fees. Um, so, you know, maybe there's like a base membership and it goes up. So the membership model then provides the revenue engine to sustain the operating costs. And then in that case, you're competing directly with the private sector. And think of like fitness centers, like the YMCA is enough profit. Well, so is the works. They're competing directly with places like Good Life Fitness. Um, the fees for programs that are not revenue engines then cover direct costs. So you would rarely contribute as much revenue as um, as membership fees. So you do have to manage members, though, and in you know a large not for profits like the YMCA, there's probably like a man like a, a a person in charge of just like membership director of memberships or something like that. And, you know, it's cheaper and easier to keep an existing member than to find a new one. 
So yeah, they're the membership director. They're really then about building relationships with m members. They're doing customer rela relations, evaluations, and like surveys, satisfaction. They're staying in regular contact. And they also might provide like discounts and special programs or personal services for, for members. And part of the membership model, though, is you also have to look for new members. So that's advertising the programs, uh, incentives to existing members to bring their friends, uh, discounts or initiation fee waivers, that sort of thing. Another large part of not-for-profits are uh, donations and grants. And you're seeking donations and grants to defray operating costs if you're unable to establish revenue engines. And often then this is through government funds. In Canada, it's common for not-for-profits to receive provincial and municipal funds. Then there's also fundraising and donations. Um, so fundraising is the process of soliciting and gathering monetary contributions or donations to other resource uh, to other resources by nonprofit or governmental agencies. And um, so it doesn't fund. It could be. It doesn't have to be money. It can be other types of like donations or any type of resource. Right? It could be a building. It could be equipment. Um, lots of things. It could be time. Even, you know, for example, an accountant who wants to like give volunteer their time, their service, waive their fee to do your accounting or that sort of thing. Um, I remember my mom um, had a book when I was and I read it when I was a teenager. It was called Let's Put the Fun in Fundraising. Anyway, it was great. I still remember it. Um, I mean, often there are uh, like in large not for profits. Uh, they are looking at fundraising consultants and they're brought in to reassure the board that, you know, it's, um, you know, what's going on and to make sure that like, especially if staff are new or not really sure about fundraising and it might seem like it costs a lot of money, but sometimes it's actually effective because it helps to improve your fundraising at first. And then you can, you know, it's just a consultant. You don't have to keep them forever. There are um, two types of fundraising then. There's primary fundraising and secondary fundraising. Primary fundraising is usually campaigns that are run right by the organization itself, and that's to cover operating or capital costs. Secondary fundraising um, is typically for operating cost support. Um, and this like um, might be you know, the, again, this is for really large not-for-profits. This is when they're doing campaigns. So it's not like you, uh, the organization itself isn't running the campaign. It's an external organization, like the United Way. So obviously, the ultimate goal is to provide security for the future when you're doing primary fundraising because it's dealing with operating expenses. So this could be like annual fundraising events that you might do, capital campaigns to defray capital costs like land, building, and equipment, or building an endowment fund. What is an endowment fund, you may ask? Well, it's groups of investments that provide a steady stream of dividends to the not-for-profit. It helps to, you know, smooth out the effects of like rise and fall of donations or in the economy. Um, and, you know, it can also help with, it could be just used for generating income or it could be used for things like scholarships or capital costs, projects. So an endowment fund is set up when it's usually like someone who has money contributes or could be a bunch of people who have large chunks of money they donate this large chunk to an endowment fund and it goes into you know the a bank and that um, amount of money makes uh, you know some interest every year well that interest then is then 
um, used to help with you know other costs or it could be restricted so for example at at mine we have endowment funds for scholarships and you know they often are named after certain people and that's like for example a family often people like someone who died or in memory of someone they've set up a um a fund a scholarship they donated a whole chunk of money up front and then the interest um you know is then used to fund the scholarship So as I said, capital campaigns happen now. This does not happen as much in um, in our field. However, it is more it is common in healthcare. Like if capital campaigns happen, for example, at um, you know at the hospital, you usually have large versus small donors. So uh, a large donor would be giving twenty five to fifty percent, and um, where secondary next level would be ten to twenty five. And, you know, large donors usually have naming rights. And this is actually more common in the U.S. It's more political there. But, you know, as I've aged, um, even at the university level, you know, names used to be, um, buildings used to be named after educators or researchers um, or, you know, historical people. And now they're named after um, organizations, corporations even on campus, but you see that as, especially in the States. Uh, I've noticed that like at the University of Waterloo where I went to, you know, we used to be um, engineering one, engineering two, uh, you know, math, you know, all just boring names. Uh, and now it's all um, donors names. And the, the hard part too is like, you know, think of the um, uh, Bruno Center uh, building. It used to be called the Inco building. And I think it had a name before that, you know, so the name can change because of the um, large donor changes. Small donors are obviously like, like more like it can be like 25 to a thousand dollars. But you still need these small donors, but you have to have, um, they often want to see large donors give too. So donor cultivation then is important in uh, fundraising, again, in not-for-profit. Donor cultivation is the term that's used in fundraising to describe the relationship building part um, that is important. And you have to care, look at your donor base. A group of, uh, the donor base is the group of people within a committee who are regular contributors to your community charities and not-for-profit organizations. So this is like all about making friends with the donors, you know, donors give to their friends, not to organizations. Or there's um, the rule of 10, be patient in relationship building. Don't ask for a donation until at least the 10th meeting with potential donor. I'm going to um, end the uh, lecture here for now. And we'll just further discuss about donations um, in the next lecture. I just feel that uh, this is uh, getting a little long of a video. And it's a topic that is probably not the uh, most fun to have to sit through and listen. So I'm going to end it here and we'll do uh, part two of this uh, lecture.